Thank you, Bill and Todd. Listen to your heart. We're going to be talking about our heart today. Not only listening to it, <laughs> but living from it, expressing it into our world. We are wrapping up our series on living untethered. How many of you have read the book? Very good. Some of you have. The rest of you, I'm going to make this up as I go along, so you won't know. <laughs> One of the things those of us who have reading, are reading the book or have read the book have discovered, it's kind of a difficult book. And I think it's difficult for a reason. I think, after having finished the book myself now, that the author wrote it that way to get us to think, to get us to examine, to get us to go deep. You know, that's what unity is all about. I just read a wonderful article that I'm going to be sharing via our email and all of that kind of stuff written by Mark, Reverend Mark Hicks, who is the head of an organization called Truth Unity, which is in charge of archiving all of our Unity writings and everything and making them available online to the public. Check out the website. There's a lot of wonderful information there. But he wrote an article about what Charles and Myrtle envisioned Unity to be at the very beginning. And that was not a church, nor was it a place where you came and, and did a service like we do nowadays. Originally, it was a place not for spiritual seekers, but for those who wanted to be spiritual practitioners. How many of you would like to stop seeking and start practicing our truth principles? I know many of you are already doing that, but there's always room to do more. There's always room to more, learn more. And that's a lot of what this book has been about, is about going deeper. It's about not just untethering our souls from this, but becoming a practitioner of living from the heart. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be going pretty deep. This is going to be very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Very deep, very introspective. It's going to ask us, to really look at how we go from just coming together and hearing these wonderful words and this wonderful music and all of that to actually putting it into practice in our lives because that's ultimately what it's about. It's great to get together on Sunday morning. I love seeing all of you. I love hearing our music. But more powerful is if we put it, this into practice in our daily lives and take it out into the world so that others can be aware of it. So what we are, have been about, actually since the inception of unity, but specifically in this series, is discussing and exploring how we can transcend our habitual thoughts and emotions. Those things that hold us back from experiencing true happiness and true fulfillment. The principle taught in this particular book is one very important and one that has been taught by every great master, and that is non-attachment. We think of that, as I said last week, in the terms of the Buddhist teachings. But Jesus taught the very same thing. He said, let go of your attachment to the outer and attach to the inner. Free your soul from that which holds you in bondage. Free your soul, free yourself from that which holds you in low frequency vibration so that you can rise up to a higher frequency. And the way we do that is by becoming aware and living from our heart mind. Now you may be going, well, what's the heart mind? Well, we know science has proven what the ancient masters taught, that our heart has intelligence. There actually is a thinking organ that is part of our, the heart that pumps our blood which we didn't know about until fairly recently. It's a real thing. It's not just some metaphysical woo-woo thing. It's real. It takes up room in your chest. <laughs> and it serves a purpose. We think of living from the heart as living from a place of love. And while that is certainly true, it's so much more than that. You know, we've all seen people, we've see them oftentimes out in the world who go around going, I am love. Happy, happy. Fuzzy bunnies everywhere. Oh, bless you. You are love. And that is true. But that's not living from the heart. 
that's trying to force an illusion of love so that we can maybe feel it. It's trying to become something that we can't unless we truly, truly live from the heart. And living from the heart is living in such a way that your natural energy is emanating at its highest frequency. It is living in such a way that your natural energy is emanating at its highest frequency. And it doesn't always look like we think it should. It doesn't always look like a Hallmark movie. Okay, that didn't go over well. <laughs> so then what is heart-mind? Well, heart-mind is the mind that is about life. It is about evolu evolution, whereas the human mind is about survival. This up here is designed to help you survive in the world. This is about having greater life and evolving to something even more than you are right now, regardless of where you are on your journey. This mind, the heart mind, is about deep relationship. Not just deep relationship to other people, but to life itself, to creation itself, to the creator itself. For in heart mind, there is no separation between the creator and the creation. It's all one thing. The heart mind is also about creativity. Look at the universe, galaxies, stars, all the stuff that's out there is constantly being created and more and more and more of it. Look at life. It's constantly being created. Heart mind is about creation and it is about creativity. How can we create? What do we create? What does it look like? Can we create at a higher level than we have created to this point? The author, Michael Singer, writes, heart mind is an integrated whole that combines emotional intelligence, which is the heart, with cognitive intelligence, providing an interconnectivity between feeling and thought. Got it? <laughs> let's, let's do it, look at it through the lens of Bible metaphysics, which is one of the tools we use here at Unity. Adam and Eve represent heart, mind, and human mind. Mary and Joseph represent cognitive ability, cognitive thinking, and heart thinking. And when the two of those become one, the Christ is born. That is the metaphysics of the story of the birth of Jesus. When the two become one, the Christ is fully realized in the oneness of the heart-mind. And that is the ultimate goal. So what does that incorporate then? When, if we can reach that point, which we can, it's not an if. When we reach that point, what are the key aspects of it? Well, first there's emotional intelligence, which is understanding and managing our emotions. Emotions are real things. But we can understand them. And we can manage them. It is recognizing and empathizing with the emotions of others. When we can understand our own, guess what? We can understand others' emotions. It is cultivating positive relationships and social skills. Cognitive intelligence is logical reasoning and analytical thinking. It's problem solving and decision making ability. It's the acquisition of knowledge and intellectual development. But wait, there's more. We discover an entirely new and higher vibration when we bring these two together, when they are working in harmony with one another. This is what the, what the Christ taught. It's what the Buddha taught. It's what Krishna taught. Every great teacher throughout human history has said the exact same thing in different languages and at different times based on culture. But the message has always been the same. Our journey is to move from this to this and then bring them into harmony with one another. It's not to get rid of one or the other. It's not to operate solely from the heart or solely from the mind. It's to bring them together as a whole. You know, all of those great teachers were more than teachers. They were more than hero, um, healers, well, heroes too. They were more than miracle workers. They were all about creating. 
creating, creating a new world, a new understanding, creating the awareness of the truth of who we all are. Every single one of them said, you are the same as me. Jesus always said, I am born of man, meaning I am like you. He said things like, you are sons and daughters of the Most High. They were all were teaching about love in its highest form. Love is often described as a multi-dimensional energy in the realm of, that we're talking about. A multi-dimensional energy. Einstein once said that gravity is love. It's the great attractive force, but it's more than that. It's also the great creative energy. And where we struggle in Western thought especially is that we think of heart and mind, emotion and reason, as being separate from one another. Whereas in Eastern thought, Buddhism, Taoism, the heart and the mind are a unified entity. The Chinese call it the Zen, which encapsulates both mind and heart. The idea of, this idea of separation is so strong and so prevalent in the Western mind that it has impacted everything we do and how we do it. It created a religion where God and humanity are separate. Even though the, the one who is purported to have founded Christianity, Jesus, he didn't found Christianity, by the way, even though he taught that it was one and the same, and that has led to many of the problems that we see in our world today. This idea of a separate deity and a separate creation has led to an idea of separate races, separate religions, separate nations, separate political parties, separate cultures. And that has resulted in the problems we see today. Poverty, war, racism, and the inability to evolve. It's led to misunderstanding of the teachings of the Christ, the Buddha, and the others. It has led us to not understand Jesus' statement, be in the world, but not of it. When Jesus said that, he was not talking about the physical world. He knew that the physical world was but an outer expression of the human mind, this. We create the physical world we live in through this. And Jesus said, there's more. And if we want to change that out there, we have to move to this mind. Because this mind only knows what it knows. It only knows the knowledge it has acquired through generations, through experience. It is an illusion of thought, which is what the world is, according to the Buddhists. It's an illusion of thought. It is a creation of low vibration thought. Nowadays, we could call it a consensus reality. We agree that we have to live under certain conditions and constructs where there's only so much to go around, where there's always going to be war. The list goes on and on and on. That is not the truth. Because if we could realize that it is possible to untether ourselves from this illusion of reality that we have created from the human level, we would find that we would be living an entirely different reality. A reality of one people, one spirituality, one world, one culture. And instead of the differences between us, we would behold with wondrous awe the diversity within us. We would no longer be in the world, at least not the illusionary one. But this requires us to do work. It requires that we untether our soul. It requires that we break free of the human mind manifestation of this world that we have created and come into a realization of what we in unity call the Christ or the kingdom of heaven, the truth that underlies this up here and what we have expressed out there to this point. Charles Fillmore wrote a lot about this. He talked about the realization of the Christ. And that doesn't mean we realize that Christ was a person who lived 2,000 years ago. We realize, we make real the Christ 
in ourselves, in our experience. We bring it from within us because it's in every one of us into expression. In Talks on Truth, Charles Fillmore wrote this, the attainment of the Christ consciousness calls for nothing less on our part than a definite recognition of ourselves as children of God right here and right now, regardless of appearances to the contrary. How does that feel to recognize, we would actually say it a little different nowadays. We would say recognize that we are God expressing as us. How does that feel? I imagine, because it still comes up even in me sometimes, that, oh, who am I to think I'm God? I'm not God. Look at what I just did. Yes, you are God. That's what Jesus taught. Do you not know that you are sons and daughters of the Most High? He said that. And yet you won't hear that in most churches. Our ideas of separation have fully pre prevented us from realizing it. And we have squashed that down. And as we become untethered from our rational human mind and begin to be free to explore the heart mind and to let the heart mind do what it's designed to do, we begin to be able to come into acceptance and realization of the Christ we are and the Christ we are becoming. In Adam's Smashing Power of the Mind, another book by Charles Fillmore, he wrote this, let us cease expecting Jesus to return in bodily form. And I'm going to break in here and say, if you, if you read the original scriptures, Jesus never said he was going to do that. Come to a Bible class here and you'll find out why. Anyway, back to Charles. Rather, let us turn our attention to the risen Christ energy that is already within us. For it is in this way that we will create the kingdom of heaven on earth. And the kingdom of heaven, this is me now, the kingdom of heaven is not a physical manifestation with streets of gold and peace and people walking around like this. It's a high vibration of energetic existence that is peace, that is love, that is abundance, that is creative, that is evolutionary. That's in us and always have been. But we have, been, we have tethered our souls to an illusion of power, of control, and of bondage. That's been the focus of this book, is breaking that tether, breaking free. The moment, the moment that we can behold the Christ in us and as us, is the moment we begin to truly live the Christ. It is the moment we raise our vibration to that high level. But until we recognize that, until we can accept that we are God expressing, the indwelling Christ remains dormant. It remains in the tomb. Our job is to roll that stone of thinking away that has been built up through thousands and thousands of years of indoctrination. To get back to the true teachings of Jesus, the true teachings of Buddha, the truth. So how do we do that? You know, I always like to give you steps. Well, here's some steps. These are practices that will cultivate heart-mind integration. First, mindfulness and meditation. Notice how we always start with meditation? That is the doorway. If you don't have a meditation practice, get one. It will change your life. And don't think that you have to meditate for 20 minutes, fold it up into a pretzel. One minute. One minute. 30 seconds. Whatever you have to do to start, just get a, a steady, consistent meditation practice. Practice things that promote present moment awareness and emotional regulation. When you meditate, you begin to become aware of what's happening around you in the moment. Rather than always living either in the past or in the future. Second one is emotional reflection. You could do journaling if you're into that. Look at your feelings. 
develop understanding about where they come from. Next one is practice cognitive exercises. This one's something we don't do well in our culture. We don't teach it even, and it's a biggie. What this is, is going deep. It's not just attending church on Sunday morning, eating a cookie and going home. <laughs> it's delving into these ideas, delving into the, attending the classes, reading the books, getting involved in our own evolution. I grew up like many of you, where I was told on Sunday morning how to live, what to do, you know, what prayers to say and all of that. But it wasn't until I found unity and I started really looking within that I began to understand that we are evolutionary beings. We are meant to become more than we are. We are meant to be untethered from this. And it took years of practice. And it will take many more years of practice. But it's a journey. And it is a journey that is worth it. So get involved in our own evolution as individuals. Because then we can empower those around us to get involved in theirs. Another one is compassion training, developing empathy and kindness through practices like loving kindness, meditation, or volunteer work. That's one of the ways we can empower those around us to find their truth selves. And the last step is let go. Untether yourself from the illusion. Practice possibility thinking, possibility talking, and possibility action. We live in a world where we talk about all the bad things. I hear it even here at the church. Oh, did you hear what happened so-and-so? Did you hear what this person's doing or that person's doing? Or, oh, we can't ever do that. That's negativity. That's not possibility thinking. That's not possibility talking. Yes, we are in the midst of what I am calling economic evolution. This is happening in the outer world. But in my consciousness, this is happening. And it's not going down. I have a vision. I have a vision of this being more than what's right here, right now. I have a vision of us really, truly impacting our city, our community, and beyond. I have a vision of unity as a, as a movement breaking out of the stuck place it has been for the last 20 years and getting back to what the vision was, centers of spiritual practice, empowering people and teaching people to change their lives because then we begin to change the world. But we can't get there if we're always talking it down. Oh, we don't, look at us, there's what, 75 of us here today? Oh, we can't do anything. Yes, we can. We are powerful beyond measure. So we have to get into the vibration of what we want to create. That's what the heart is all about, vibration. We get into that vibration of reaching the world. We get into a vibration of health, of love, of prosperity in all of its forms. And once we can begin to do that as individuals, we transmute Jesus' mission statement into our own affirmation. How many of you remember what Jesus' mission statement was? I have come that you may have life and have it. I have come that you may have life and have it. That's better. But when we untether from this, it's no longer some guy's statement 2,000 years ago. It changes to our own affirmation that is, I have come that I have life and I have it abundantly. I have life and I have it abundantly. Say that with me. I have life and I have it abundantly. I noticed a little drop in the abundantly. We got work to do. Let's try it again. I have life and I have it abundantly. That is living from the heart. For once you have it, you cannot help but empower those around you to have it. Because as untethered souls, we live in oneness. We live in oneness with one another and with the energy that is creation itself. Namaste.